If you've spent any time at all trying to sell something online, you'll have heard how important it is to build a list. Bet you've heard that. I mean, you can't go five minutes without somebody telling you that you need a list. And yeah, they're right. A list is really important. But that's only part of it. Having a list, well, it's all well and good. But even a list with the right kind of audience doesn't mean you're home and dry. Not by a long way. I know, it can be really frustrating. And I'm speaking from experience here. It can be really frustrating when you've, you've built your list, you've spent a lot of time and real money attracting the audience to find out they're still not buying like you'd hope. I know, I've been there. I feel your pain. Well, in this video, I'm going to share one really simple way to fix this. The strategy, the simple strategy that we're going to cover will, and I'm not overplaying this, it will return an higher percentage of sales than any other fancy strategy you can name. I was using this way back in 2007 when I started Infinite Skills. It worked back then and it still works just as well today. And you know what? Despite how well it works, the majority of online marketers still don't do what I'm going to share, which frankly is insane. Now, if getting a whole lot more sales sounds like something you could use in your business, hit that like button and click the subscribe button too while you're at it. That helps me make more cool stuff for you. So let's get to it. So what's this magic formula that I'm talking about? Well, you've likely already guessed. I mean, the title kind of ruins the surprise. I'm talking about a welcome email sequence. Now, I'm not talking about a welcome email. Oh, no, totally different. I'm talking about a sequence, a, a sequence that's crafted in such a way to funnel traffic. That's new traffic through a carefully laid out series of steps that will, well, not put too fine a point on it, will outsell any other email sequence by a country mile. Now, let me tell you, let me back that up with some hard facts. According to Active Campaign, and my results also reflect this, a welcome email has a far higher open rate than any other email. And when it's put into a sequence, it generates an average 89% more revenue and 332% more sales than any other email sequence. Oh, but it gets better. You see, once you've created the sequence, and we'll be coming to that shortly, I'll be showing you how. Once you've created the sequence, it then runs an autopilot, which is sweet. It's a really nice feeling waking up in the morning and seeing how much you've earned while you were asleep. If you're not doing this to say you're leaving money on the table is, is a bit of an understatement. Now, just so we're clear what we're doing here in this sequence, you don't have to be selling your main product. Most of the clients I've shared this with, they've used it to sell products between $47 and $197. It's great at this price point. It's a great way to fund your growth. And every dollar you earn is pretty much a dollar you'd have missed out on. So it's free money. There's no reason not to do this. And it goes without saying that once you've sold a product to a customer, even if it's a, a lower price product, they're then eight times more likely to buy a higher price product from you later. So as well as building revenue right out of the gate, it also warms your audience up for higher priced offers further down the line. Now, of course, there's a few things that you've got to do and there's a few things that you mustn't do. But before we start getting into all the details, let's talk about setting up the schedule. In other words, how many emails and when to send them. Now, I've experimented over the years with countless numbers of emails, trying out different formats, altering the frequency, everything you can possibly do. I've done it and I've made a lot of mistakes, which is good. I mean, that's great for you because if you follow me on this, it means you can get it right without all the pain. I've paid for all the mistakes, so no need for you to get it wrong. I have found for this to work really well, you want between six and eight emails. You can do it with six, but I found eight is easier. I found that by using eight emails, you can make the email shorter and more to the point, which is really important. I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I hate long emails. In my opinion, the shorter the better. So for the purpose of this video, I'm going to stick with eight, eight emails. So let's talk about scheduling this sequence and you've got to go do a bit of a balancing act here. What you don't want to be doing is emailing too often because you're just going to rag people off and they'll unsubscribe. But 
On the other hand, if you leave it too long, what's going to happen is that your emails, they're not going to seem connected. There'll be a disjoint. It won't work as a sequence. And besides that, people will just forget who you are. Now, the schedule, it took me a while to find the sweet spot. So before we jump into the format, let me just quickly give you the schedule just to give you a little context. So day one. Now, typically what's going to happen is your prospect is going to opt into your list, likely by downloading a lead magnet or something. This is what's going to trigger the sequence. So on day one, they're going to get the first email and I'll come to what to put in all the emails shortly. We're just sticking with the schedule for the time being. So day one, that's the first email. Then on day two, you're going to email them again. So that's two emails in two days. And then on day four, so we've skipped a day. On day four, you're going to send out email number three. And then we're going to leave a three day gap. And on day seven, the next email, email number four goes out. Then again, three days later, so that's day 10, you then send email number five. Then on day 14, so we've got a four day gap here between the last email. On day 14, you're sending out email number six. And when we get into what to include in each email, this spacing will make more sense. So just bear with me. Anyway, on day 18. So again, that's four days after the last email. You then send out email number seven. And after email number seven, you wait another three days. So that's day 21. Then on day 21, you send out email number eight, which is the last email in the sequence. So basically, we're sending more emails at the start of the sequence. So your audience doesn't forget who you are. But not so many to upset them and have them all unsubscribing. And then as we get into the sequence, we're easing off a little. Now, what I will say before we start with what to include in these eight emails, it's important through this whole process, so it feels like a sequence, that you set up clear expectations with your subscribers. You let them know what to expect next. You create anticipation. You pre-frame your audience by saying things like, tomorrow I'll be sending you whatever it is that's coming next. Or, Next week, I'm going to be sending you whatever the next email is. You're pre-framing them to treat it as a sequence. I just wanted to make that real clear. So what are you going to be putting into your emails? Well, the first time you send out an email in the first email, you're going to be creating an impression. You're setting up an expectation. If your audience thinks that your emails are short and to the point, they're going to be far more likely to open up all your other emails going forward. But if your first email is long and it just rambles on, this is what your audience will think all your emails are going to be like. When you create your emails, in fact, any sales message, the one thing that you have to remember is it's all about them. Your audience isn't really interested in you. Sorry, but that's just the way it is. All your audience is interested in is what is in it for them. So let's look at these eight emails, what to put in and how the sequence fits together. Email number one is likely the email they're going to get in response to a free lead magnet or something that they've opted in for. So it stands to reason that the email starts with a quick intro to what they've opted in for and the information on downloading it. And then once you've got that out of the way, then you'll do a short introduction. And I mean short. And then you'll prime them for email number two. Now, don't be lame about it. You've got to sell it. You've got to build a little excitement about what's coming next. Now, Email two, this is where it gets interesting. This is where you're going to start to slowly shift the mindset of the subscriber. And the best way to do this, let me tell you, is with what I call a problem solution email. It's pretty simple and it works really well. What you're doing here in email number two is using one of the most powerful emotions when it comes to selling, and that's empathy. Making your subscriber feel like you, you totally understand them, that you know exactly what they are struggling with is powerful. Using empathy as a selling tool really draws them in. Here's basically how I do it. I always like to start with a question for the subject line. And here's why. Questions are really powerful. I mean, if somebody asks you a question, it's impossible for your brain not to answer it. It's a natural response. Questions rarely go unanswered. So. I'll start with a simple question, something like, want to learn how to take better pictures? Want to learn how to train your puppy or whatever. And then to make it really connect, you should personalize it, add their name to the subject line. For example, want to learn how to take better pictures, Peter? Want to learn how to train your puppy, Peter? Now, by phrasing it like that, I'm talking directly to the subscriber. And in case you're wondering, 
Adding this personalization is really easy to do. All the email providers allow you to add a snippet of code to personalize your emails. And for the actual message for the body of the email, what I'd do is I'd describe the problem the subscriber has currently, and then I'd share the story of how somebody overcame it. Could be your story, could be the story of a client who overcame the problem. What you're doing, you're setting the stage to have them believe they're not alone. And the solution to their problem, whatever it is, well, it's achievable. And you don't need to go into fine details. You shouldn't go into fine details. You're just letting the subscriber know they're not alone. And you understand. They're in the right place, if you will. You're not telling them how to do it exactly. You're just telling them that it's possible. You're using the short story to break down the objections or false beliefs, as I like to call them. You see, here's the thing. If you outright tell the audience why what they currently believe is, is false, they're not going to believe you. But if you wrap it in a story, then it's far more powerful. Having your audience think that they've come to the conclusion by themselves, well, they now own that decision. You've now started to slowly align them with what they have to believe to invest in your solution. Now, don't forget, as you close out of email number two, to prime them for email number three. So, Email number three, what do we include? Well, in email number three, you're kind of following on from email number two, which makes sense since it's a sequence. You want all the emails to feel like a continuation. But in email number three, you're continuing to break down objections to shift your audience's mindset. But this time in email number three, you're focusing on why people fail. You're highlighting the reasons why people don't manage to get whatever the transformation is, the result that you're offering. The tone of the email is along the lines of, it's not your fault you've failed so far. The information you have is wrong. You're still underpinning the tone of the email with empathy. In email three, you, you hint you have a solution, a product, you'd mention it's because of all this information. And that's why you created a product to fix it. Now, listen up. At this point, you're not really selling, so only hint that you've got a product. If you're going to full sales pitch here, you're going to lose them. The whole point of these emails is to, is to give value. You're breaking down objections and proving you can help by, by well helping. Works like a champ. All this trick in the book. Now, for email four, we're going to use a common sales technique here. In email four, we're going to use future pacing. Now, you may not know what it is, but I guarantee you, if you've ever read a sales page, you'll have seen it in action. Basically, future pacing, well, it's pretty simple. You're asking your audience to imagine what their life would be like if they'd bought your product, say, 12 months ago. What changes they'd have experienced, how their life would look now, when they've achieved whatever it is that your, your program delivers. Then that's half of it. The other half is then to amplify the effect of not buying your program. You come at it from a slightly different angle, what their life would be like in, say, 12 months from now if they don't, if they don't solve whatever it is that your program, your course delivers. Again. Like all the emails, I like to keep these as short as I can. But I do also like to add in the transformation that I had, or even the transformation that one of my clients had. Doing this, wrapping it in a story, it makes it real. Now, the trick with all this is to make it relatable. Remember, I cannot stress this enough. Remember, it's all about them. It's never about you. Write that down. Commit it to memory. Never forget this. Anyway, on to email number on number five, if you look at the release schedule, you'll see that we've now slowed the, the email frequency down a little. Email number five is where you move from breaking down objections, future pacing and getting your audience into the right mindset to actually selling. This is where you start to switch into selling mode. Email number five is when you present the offer. Now, essentially, this you could say is your, it should kind of open. The question that I get asked all the time when I'm talking about a welcome email sequence is, how long should the offer, how long should it be open for? One day, three days, seven days? Personally, one day, at least in my opinion, is too short. Seven days on the other hand, well, that's too long. I found that three days works really well. So what do we include content-wise in this email? Well, in email five, you should be announcing your product and who it's for, what the problem is that it cures, and of course, the results that it delivers. The tone of the email, you could say it's a, it's a little more salesy. And since you've now moved into selling mode, don't forget a clear call to action in the email. So on to email number six. Now, in email number six, I like to use social proof. Now, I'm not just talking about 
including a few snippets of testimonials from past clients. That's not what I'm talking about here. In fact, I did a whole video on testimonials. If you watch it, you'll see there's so much more to testimonials, so much that most people totally get wrong. It's worth watching. I'll put a link below. Anyway, in email number six, what I'm talking about is social proof in the way of a, in the way of a narrative, a story. Maybe a story of how you found the solution that you're offering. Maybe it's a story of how a client overcame their problem and got results with your product. But remember, and I know I say this a lot, but remember to make the story relevant and include emotions that your audience are feeling, obstacles that are in their way. And as you're telling the story, you want the audience nodding their heads and saying, heck, that's me. And again, don't get so carried away that you forget the call to action. Now, next, we've got email, email number seven. In email seven, we're going to do something that's often forgotten. I want you to look upon email seven as a clarity email. And what I mean by that is that you're going to make sure that your audience knows exactly what the process is, what your product does and how it works. And just because you understand exactly how it works doesn't mean it's 100% clear in your audience's mind. What you've got to do in email number seven is simplify. Simplify the process. Put it into simple terms. Use steps so they can visualize how your program is going to deliver on its promise. You don't. In fact, you shouldn't go into too much detail. You're just giving an overview what it is, how it works, and of course, why it's so effective. And again, don't forget the call to action. Now, next, we get to email number eight, which is the final email in the sequence. And the thing about email number eight is those people that get to read it, they're likely very interested in your offer. They're interested in what you've got to say. I mean, they've stuck around through the whole sequence and are still reading. Email number eight, the purpose is to try and convince those still on the fence to sign up. Email number eight is the wrap up email. Now, there are a few things that you've got to include content wise in this email. You've got to recap the benefits of your product. You've got to convey a sense of urgency. You've got to let your audience know this is the last chance that they're going to have to take advantage. And you've got to make this really clear. Spell it out that the offer ends and this is their last chance. And I also like to do a little bit more future pacing, telling them, or should I say, getting them to imagine what their life would be like 12 months from now if they bought my product and what it's likely going to be like if they don't. Now, I know this can feel a little sleazy, but if you word it right, you'll be just fine. And finally, I'd advise dropping in a, another short story, a testimonial, social proof that your product delivers on its promise. Oh, and don't forget the call to action. So... That's a simple sequence. And like I said, as simple as this is, if you follow the steps in this sequence, it works really well. You can make money while you sleep. Now, you may have thought, OK, Andrew, I get it. But as good as this sounds, how do I create an offer for each individual customer and then have the offer expire after whatever the time period you set the offer to? In this case, it was three days for each individual customer. Well, it's actually pretty easy. There's a really cool program that does just this, and it's called Deadline Funnels. And I'll put a link below. But basically, Deadline Funnels, it allows you to run an evergreen sales funnel pretty much the same as a live event. It creates a time-limited offer for every single member. And then after the time period ends, the offer expires. Well, there you go. That's the welcome email sequence. And I hope you enjoyed this lesson as much as I enjoyed creating it. If you like this video, hit the like button. And if you want more tips from me, remember to hit the subscribe button too. So until next time, bye for now.